بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما تعلمنا وزدنا من فضلك علما وتعليما إنك على كل شيء قدير ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم Welcome everyone to our fourth uh, lesson our penultimate session in our study of the tafsir of Surah Yasin So inshallah ta'ala today we are on lesson four in our journey through Surah Yasin, the 36th chapter of the Holy Quran, described as the heart of the Holy Quran, we last time were looking at signs in the universe. And the signs in the universe were describing, pointing out the ayat, the signs of Allah in his creation, in the earth, in the food, in the crops, and then in the heavens all indicating the perfect knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his might, his plan, and his destining of everything. Everything has a particular apportioned life cycle, and it has a purpose, and it has a conclusion. All pointing out the ultimate, uh, the ability, if you like, the power of God to actually bring about the, the resurrection, the final judgment, and that that indeed is the end of man's journey in, in all of this. And so today we're going to be looking at the rising, the very resurrection itself. Now, what, what occasions this discussion in Surah Yasin is a particular sarcastic comment. And so the very last thing we left off with, and we'll just revisit the very last verse so you can see the connection, the very last thing we left off with was the stubbornness of the people that the Quran is in this dialogue with almost, these deniers. So part of their stubborn re rejection was, uh, was that when people asked them, why don't you feed the poor? They said, who are we? God can take care of them. You guys are fools. Your religion is contradictory. And so it was part of this stubborn denial you know, describing this, the state of these interlocutors, that the Quran poses one of their favorite questions, that if this thing is real and we're all going to go back to God, then when is it? Bring it about. When is it? Tell me when. I, in their mind, it's to show that it's all fake. There, there is no date you can give me because there is no date, because there is no event. And so it's one of these sarcastic comments that Surat Yasin grabs it. It grabs a hold of it, and the whole of today is a response to a question that wasn't really asking for an answer. Because they're asking, when was it, wasn't actually asking, when is it? It was a sarcastic shutdown of, from their point of view. But the surah is going to grab it and it's going to say, you want to know about that day? Well, let's, let's move, move with me. And that's why in this discussion, we're going to see the word today mentioned about six times, today, 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 today. The word today is going to be ringing in the ears of these questioners as they're gonna get a very visual journey now through that day. And that's gonna occupy us in today's section. So you have your sarcastic comment, which is verse 448, which leads to a description of when the day falls, how sudden will it be? And what's it going to be like? And in fact, it's not one day because there's two events that, are, that we would call judgment day or the end of the world. There's two events. And these two events are sometimes called the two blowings of the trumpet, uh, which, which will be mentioned. Um, there's an angel, Israfil, السلام, who is the angel assigned to signal this all important, all destructive moment. And he signals it and he's waiting for an instruction. He signals it with a blow. And with that blow comes the destruction of, of this world. That, that's what we, what we sometimes refer to as judgment day, which is the destruction. 
the earthquakes, the mountains crumbling, the earth flattening, because a new order is about to come. And the new order, in the order of justice, there's nothing to hide behind. Because right now, my intentions are hidden from you. My acts are hidden from you. In the walls of my house, no one sees me. So on that day, because it's the plane of justice, we'll be seeing the, the theme of justice today, everything is flattened. There's nothing to hide behind. Everything is open. Everything is public. Everything is clear. And so that's one event that we sometimes refer to as Judgment Day, but it's really, it's the end. It is the destruction of everything. And it's the killing, if you like, or the taking of the life from every soul, every soul, humans, jinn, angels, it's the end of life. And it's the destruction of the order. So there's, a, there's a, an indication of that from the first half of those verses, from verse 49, 50, uh, in this first half there. And then there's the actual coming out, coming out of the graves, which is also which is called the resurrection. This is properly speaking, the second event is properly speaking judgment day, because that's when people will come out of the graves and they'll be gathered and that will be the actual day of the judgment. And the second coming, this arising from the graves after everything else was killed is often referred to as the second blowing of the trumpet. So the angel will blow a second time and that's when the new order will commence. And between these two blowings is a length of time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Uh, in Surah Ghafir, it is a verse that the scholars say this verse is God's declaration of his mastery, of his kingship, that when everything is destroyed after the first blowing, he says, Liman il mulku whose is the kingdom today? And there's no fake kings left to, to declare their own kingdom. And so he answers, Lillahi al-Wahid al-Qahar. This kingdom is only Allah's, the one, the all overpowering, the undeniable, the un unresistible, the, the uh, irresistible. And so we're going to then see a few verses about resurrection, which fold up these two events. The first blowing, which is a sort of death or a taking of life and a taking of the order, and a second blowing, which is the actual coming back. And then from that, we have a sojourn, a short one, uh, to the people of the garden. It's a short description, but it's a very beautiful short description uh, of the bliss of the people of the garden. And then we come back to simply the, what I've called simply the unbelievers. And the section ends with, if you like, a dialogue with them and a description of their state. And from there, it kind of goes on to a further dialogue with them, which is the next session because it's their question that all this is an answer to. It's their sarcastic remark which is being addressed. And so the, 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 the scenery of the rising all ends with them. And so then the question arises then, this description of the people of the garden, how is that a part of answering their question? And so this is something where seeing, if you like, we, we raised it as well last time, which is that the Quran has the, the surahs of the Quran always have an argument thread that every scene you're seeing is a response or a development of a particular argument that the Quran is taking you on through its arc. Like we saw the description of the sun in and of itself, there's so much to think about. The description of the food we saw last week, there was so much to think about the majesty of God, the gratitude we owe to Him in our food the glory of God who made everything in pairs, every unit along that arc is presented in a way to connect to other arcs within the Holy Quran, but it also connects to its immediate arc, which we said last time was about God's ability to bring about the resurrection and how that fits the plan of the cosmic order. So there's like a core argument, and then there's these larger arcs that the these core arguments connect to. So for some scholars, the whole description of the people of the garden is just a part of speaking to the unbelievers that on that day, you'll see where these people really are and then you'll see where you really are. So we'll see how this connects. So this was the very last verse we ended on last time, which was showing that when the believers urge them, feed the needy, they, they respond with mockery. They say, hang on, you believe in God. God gives the food, so God can take care of them. What's it got to do with us? You, 
you foolish people of a foolish religion. You believe in God, then you suddenly believe we have to take care of people. So it showed their stubbornness, their mocking acts of charity, and something that we highlighted last time, which was that religion always is connected to two things. We said, venerating God and showing pity and compassion to his slaves. And so a, a Quranic theme is that true charity connects with belief in resurrection. And when there, when there is no belief in resurrection, the mark of that or the character trait that accompanies that is this disregard for true charity. And so it, it flows on that after they rejected the need to feed anyone, then they came with this mocking question, which I said sets the scene for all of today's presentation. And they say, it's a present tense verb, almost they say it frequently. They are often saying in their mockery, Mata, when? This promise. So where is the this coming from? Because it's not you know it's not an immediate comment so they say it shows that the believers spoke about it the day is coming think about it wake up wake out of your heedlessness remember the one who feeds you and created you and so they're almost fed up with hearing this this thing you're talking about when is it then this promise uh the word wa'ad so the, the scholars interpret the word here referring to the word of the final judgment Sometimes in, in religious discourse or Islamic discourse or even in a tafsir discourse, they sometimes differentiate two terms, wa'ad and wa'id. Wa'ad often meaning a good promise, wa'id meaning the bad promise or the threat. So the wa'ad is, for example, that there's paradise for the believers, wa'id, hellfire for the unbelievers. But the word wa'ad here is, is, is encompassing everything. The wa'ad, this promised time, the promised meeting with our Lord. When is it then they say, in kuntum sadiqeen, if, uh, showing their doubt, if you people really claim to be speaking such truth, then when is it? So in terms of a construction, just to say there's two parts to it, this is highly uh, emphatic. It's emphatic because sadiqeen is, uh, is a noun. It's not just people who've told the truth once, but telling truth is their permanent state. Kana is a verb of being. So if your being is such that you are permanently and constantly speaking truth, then tell us when is this day? Uh, and here is the doubt that we don't believe anything of this about you. But if you believe you're on the truth and we don't believe it, then answer this question. When's the moment that all this is about? The address is in plural as well, because those who are reminding them, wake up, don't be heedless, think about it, are not just the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but it's the believers with them. So you group of people, we don't believe anything of your truth. Speak then, if you, if you are as you claim, when is the promise? And now comes the answer that they weren't expecting, as if their question was real. مَا يَنظُرُونَ إِلَّا صَيْحَةً وَاحِدَةً تَأْخُذُهُمْ وَهُمْ يَخِصِّمُونَ they are not waiting. Nadara literally means to look with the eye. Intadara uh, or intidhar, which comes from this root, means waiting. And here, ma yanzuruna means that they're not waiting for anything, you know, except for a single cry. And that's a reference to this, what I call this first blowing of the trumpet. It's as if to say that they don't need to wait for it. It's just about to come. So yanzuru, they say, is something closer than yantaviru. If both verbs in Arabic mean waiting, yanzuru means it's really close. It's, you're almost about to be able to see it, back from the original root, nadara, to see. It's something just about to come. They will just catch a glimpse of it now. They're not waiting for anything except just a sayha. That's all that they're really waiting for. One cry. Sayha. Wahida, it's just one, it's a simple event. It's not a huge, you know, multi stage thing that it's going to take a while to come. It's just a moment. Sayha Wahida, all they're waiting for is just a moment. And this one cry will seize them. Again, that's fairly well rendered there. 
Akhav means to grab something, to take it as if the thing is powerless and you've completely, completely taken a grip of it from all directions. Ta'khuduhum, this one scream will take them. And what will their state be? Will they be ready? Will they be prepared? Will they have a rumbling that, oh, it's about to come right now? Nothing. They will know nothing about it because their state will be one completely engrossed. Wahum, and what is their state? These questioners are people who are like these questioners. They will be yachissimun. Khasam, khusuma means dispute. Uh, you know, dispute could be in all kinds of things. You're, you're, you know, you're in the shop, you're fighting with your boss. Now you said, no, but my contract says, no, but you haven't done your work. And you're so engrossed with wanting something, with somebody who is so equally engrossed with wanting it back from you. So this is the khusuma, uh, implying that they're engrossed in their markets, engrossed in their dealings. And in that moment of extreme engrossment, it will come. There's a hadith, the commentators quote here, that says uh, in, in translation, the trumpet will be blown and people will be in their pathways and their markets and their gathering places. So much so that maybe that a, an, a, a cloth will be between two men who are, who are, uh, who are um, negotiating over it within the market. Neither of them having the chance to release it from their hand until that blow is blown and they will all fall. So the idea that there's no rumbling, there's no preparation, there's no sense, a moment will come, the cry will be cried and it will capture them from all directions. And they'll be just from the middle of a full engrossment with what they thought was so important, fighting over something for themselves, which is the mo model for their entire lives their entire lives, why couldn't they ever listen to what the prophets were saying? Why is the Quran shaking them so much with this moving imagery from heaven to earth to this very powerful imagery today? Because that's all that they need. I mean, that's all that will help them is a full shaking because they're only engrossed over these paltry things. And it's, so it's fitting that the final moment captures them in the state they've always been in, engrossed over the, the very paltry matters. And so what comes next then? Or rather a, a description, how intense, how sudden is their falling? They are not waiting except for a single scream or a single cry that will grab them while they're fully engrossed in their disputes. And so as a consequence of that, first, so then what, what arises after that one cry? It's, it's a more visual way, uh, if you like, this verse, just to present the, the sudden grip that that cry has taken over them. A tawsiyah is your final testament, like your will, the final injunctions that you, so when someone typically is dying, they're on their deathbed, they're in a hospital, they've been stabbed, uh, they're bleeding away, but there's people there and they're about to go and they realize, oh, they might not make it right now. There's a few things that comes through a person's mind at that moment. Some things are maybe you can say internal, like regrets or thoughts, or wow, I wasn't ready for this. But then there's some things that are that return back to the life that you're in right now, like, oh, Please tell my wife I love her, or um, please, you know, tell them, oh, I left my my will in this place. Or there's your final things you want to say to the people you're leaving behind. Your final injunction, uh, a final injunction or a final will, will talk about your wealth, where where you wanted to go. It might talk about your final words of advice for your children, uh, and so it's saying that they will not be able to make any testament. Because, you know, why, why speak of this? Because in that moment, the one thing you want to do is say something. And saying is the easiest thing that you're able to do. It's not movement of anything, but a very small part of your body. 
the last thing you're able to control when you're when you're on your deathbed or your sick bed normally it's it's your last words but this thing will seize them in such a grip in such a moment that no it will just take them from a dispute to that's it to this dying dying down of the flames if you remember the story of the people of the city it was just it was just a scream again the same word was used there and their embers die down so not even a word can they make now wala ila ahlihim yarji'un and there's no way for them to go back now to their families there's no way for them to leave the market there's no running away there's no running to anywhere to hide there's no find grouping up with with the, with the people that you love there's no going back and again if you were to look back at the surah you'll see lots of imagery of words we saw in the beginning of our last session haven't they seen all the people who we've destroyed of the previous peoples they're not coming back to them rather they're going on somewhere else so similarly here now just like an entire civilization doesn't come back to other human civilizations once they're gone they're gone similarly this individual he has nowhere else to go back to now his journey is going on somewhere else now wa nufikha fi suri now we're going to the, the what we call the second blowing the time when they rise up now wa nufikha fi suri fa idha hum min al ajdathi ila rabbihim yansilun and the trumpet will be blown uh this is said in the in the passive uh sometimes the passive verb you know not focusing on the doer it's to really bring to your attention this act the act that what is just a it's just a a simple act for god again no fanfare again the the negation of fanfare is a theme we had from last time as well even from the time before uh the people of of the city who killed that believing man we were told at the end of it yeah there were no armies or forces or anything because that's not our way it was just a cry and they were gone so just emphasizing ease uh for god to bring about these huge events just focus not on the doer or how great the angel is uh simply look at this idea it's just a nafkha it's just a blow into this sur into this huge being and then then here you know immediately after lo suddenly lo and behold everything bursts to life and again the focus is on these people these mocking people who the the surah is shaking with a lot of visual imagery today these people what's going to happen to them they from the graves to the lord will be running and so the emphasis almost is on your from and your to before saying what it is that's happening they these people will be from the ajdath ajdath is the plural of jadath which is says a reference to an open grave as opposed to qabr which is your closed grave why the open grave because everything is opened up now it's time for the earth to expel its burdens and for the people to 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 rise again so all of a sudden when it's blown this is the first sort of inkling that bodies will have a life of their own we're going to come back to this right at the end of today that it's that the body has been told come and so the people will find themselves you know from this grave which they'll describe in in the, in the next verse suddenly they just up and not just up but they're running uh harken back again to the to the imagery of last week that the sun is running the sun is running to its own end point and so similarly now the grave was not the end point yes life was a cycle and you got old those who lived a full cycle of life not everyone does it you know the body winds down and this winding down will come again as well as an image uh, ne- next time but the grave is not the end point because after the grave the running still has to happen the end point is to the lord anna ila rabbika al muntaha the end point is to him all of this journey of your life wherever you think it's going at the current moment in time you feel that you're determining the movements of that body that's only for a while then you go to a place then you'll come out and then suddenly the body will be telling you the body will be directing you because the end of your journey is actually then 
This is just a part of your journey, but the end of it is what's going to be coming and your body, your own body will take you to it, to that end. And so they'll be running then from these open graves to whom? To the one person they feel, you could say a dread to meet. Why? Because he's the Rub. We saw the word Rub previously as the, the nurturing Lord, the one who takes you stage to stage to stage to stage to stage to your perfection. He nurtured you and me, the speaker, and all of you. He nurtured you in the wombs of your mothers. He gave you food when it was there. And then you came out and then he produced milk in the breasts of your mothers. And he produced love for you in the hearts of your mothers. And he produced love for you in the hearts of your fathers. And he took you all the way through. And so if you've spent your whole life denying that you owe him anything, you spend your whole life fighting the messengers. And again, if you think of the image of the people of the, of the town and that little story, because that story was an image of the people whom this surah is directly addressing and then all people. This image of people whom the prophets have come and they said, you're liars and we're going to kill you. And then they killed the man. And imagine now the Lord who sent you the prophets, the Lord who gave you all these kindnesses whose kindnesses you've, de you've denied, you're going to go back and meet him. With what face are you going to meet him with? A face of such incredible shame. So whenever the word rub comes in these contexts of judgment, uh, in the context of criminals, then it's the context of the, the furthest limit of shame. The closest thing in this life maybe is you know, you've been doing so many things against your dad or, or you didn't, and then suddenly you're there with your dad. The idea that the one who's taken care of you since you were a kid and you've done all these nasty things and now you're back with him. And, they, and normally people would be rather be in jail, be with anybody, but not now their dad as well after all of that, because that's the limit of shame. And so the rub is the limit of shame and they'll be hastening towards him. Yan silun, nasala, uh, in Arabic means actually to separate something from something. So in fact, talking about dads, uh, offspring in Arabic is called nasal. It's, it's your offspring, your progeny, because it, it kind of comes out of you um, from the mother and the father, you know, from their material comes out a whole new being separate from them, but it used to be within them, contained. And just so the idea of coming forth. And so it, it fits this image of coming forth and separated now from the earth. They're, they're in the earth. And now suddenly the bodies are coming forth from, from the earth. And the scholar said has this idea of haste because they talk about moving quickly. Some, some people, do, uh, some of the scholars describe the, the yan silun, the hastening as in, you know, running with, you know, quick steps, short steps, moving quickly. And some scholars say the verb has this idea of plenitude in it, i.e. the idea that there's a huge march or a huge scene or a huge procession you know, swaths of people, throngs of people are moving quickly. So these are the various flavors of the verb yen silun that comes right at the end. They're moving quickly out towards their Lord. So it's a really shocking and sudden scene. So what the surah is emphasizing is an answer to their sarcastic question is the suddenness of everything. There's the suddenness of the first fall or the first cry, and there's the absolute suddenness of the rising. There's no rubbing your eyes out. It's just shh, and you're out. And your body is almost moving so quickly before you can even gather your thoughts, say, what on earth is going on? So it captures that bewilderment with this next question. They say, and this this saying of theirs is to capture this, this mood, which one can only imagine the mood of, of all that, that that's happening. Alu, first of all, the first thing was ya waylana. It's an expression of uh, extreme shock. So he just said, alas for us. But literally the word wail uh, means um, destruction, complete and utter destruction. Our wail 
it's almost like they're saying, come, destroy us. We, we, we want to leave this place. Take us away from here. Destroy us. Finish us off. Oh, oh, destruction. Yeah, away, Lana. And we saw this before when you're calling upon something that's not really a person. Yeah, you know, it's just saying, oh, shock. Oh, destruction. Oh, what on earth is this? They, they want to be taken out of this moment. Yeah, way lana. What a just an expression of incredible bewilderment. And then a, a, as a question, Man Who did this? Uh, Ibn Ashur mentions it's just, just a statement of uh, of uh, shock. You know, when you see something so incredible, so mind-boggling, or such, a, or you can say such an unexpected scene. Oftentimes, your first question is, "Who did that?" Uh, you know, and just a scene that's so unexpected. And so it's almost like the most unexpected moment. The immediate question is, who did this? Man ba'athana. Who has stirred us out? You know, ba'atha is to stir something on. You might like prod a camel and starts running. So ba'atha means to stir something, just to stir us forward. And just to, we just literally popped out. Man ba'athana. Who stirred us out? From our resting places, marqad, literally our sleeping places, our resting places, our literally our, our beds, places of sleep. Uh, scholars have uh, have discussed this question of you know because we've been told that there's lives in in the grave or a form of life that that everyone enjoys within the grave. Uh, enjoy meaning has uh, experiences. Uh, whether it's a blissful life or whether it's a tormenting life, but there's a form of life that the soul experiences within the grave. Uh, and yet over here, it's being referred to as a sleeping place or a resting place. Uh, and so some scholars explain that between these two blowings of the trumpet, it's all, everything is dead, including that life. It's all gone. So it's like as if they've really woken up from nothing. And they're saying, so who's woken us up from this sleeping place? Then comes this confirmation. If you read in the translation, this is what the All Merciful has promised. And the envoy spoke truthfully, spoke truly. So there's no other speakers invoked here. And so some scholars say, and that's what Sheikh Ali, my teacher, prefers, is it's from their own words, i.e., the first half of this quotation is an ex is just is it conveys to us their utter bewilderment shock and like what destruction take us what who did this uh, and then suddenly this realization when they just realize what they've come out of is the earth and they just realize that they're going towards and there's this throngs and they're going towards an end point and suddenly it all comes down a sort of a realization hits and they realize, okay, I know what this is now. And again, hearken back to the characters that the surahs provided us with to, to show this contrast or this mood with. Think of the people of that story, the people of the Qariya, you know, what was their scene? Uh, what did they say? Again, the language is all mirrored to, to help us in this connecting all the themes of the surah. Back in the story of the of the of the town, they were saying, "Oh, the All Merciful sent nothing. You guys are liars. The one who gives all these gifts and who's honored us, he's given nothing. You guys are lying to us." And so now they're realizing, "Oh my goodness, this is what the All Merciful was promising." And the Mursalun spoke the truth. Spoke the truth. The Mursalun. This ultimately is the core, almost like the core running theme of Surah Yasin. It's about the one sent. Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, the prophet of God. That's why it started by saying, I swear by the Quran, you are the prophet. You are the one sent. And so a lot of this, the, the underlying thread is the gravity of the one sent and what he's been sent with. And so that's why this, this reflection of that moment has to end with the mursaloon, the one sent, the envoys of God. And so they realize, wow, those envoys, that message, wow, this is it. This is that moment. And then you start, you can feel, and the next verses will describe what, what the feelings would be after realizing that. The people you were fighting, the people you were going to kill, the people, you know, you, you said you knew what God wanted and they didn't. And all of a sudden, wow, 
this is that thing. So you can just a little bit picture what might be uh, going through them right now. But we're going to step away from them now. We're going to have, so this verse is just a commentary, just stepping away from that scene, just to reflect it was just one thing. Again, reflect on the ease for Allah, the one who in your last verse, he can, he's directing the sun, the earth, the beautiful order of this planet. Of course he can direct that. In fact, it's so easy, it's just one expression. And the whole thing came about. In kanat illa sayhatan wahidatan. Wahidatan fa'idha hum jami'un ladayna muhdaroon. It was not except. It was nothing but one crime. Just one. And then, lo, they were gathered in our presence, summoned. They, all of these people, again, the focus of these pronouns are these people that say it can't happen and we're going to fight you uh, to the believers. No, but these people with just one blow are, are jami'ah. And we said jami'ah means majmur. They're all gathered. They're all going to be on that plane, one time, one place. And what is that place? Ladaina. It's in our presence. Uh, a very grave, solemn sort of gathering. Muhdarun. Uh, we saw this again beginning, beginning of last week they've been summoned they've been called to be present uh, and here it's emphasizing their their passiveness through no through no act or through no volition or through no option they were summoned and then and so they came and so you capture that in the scene of, of the bodies rushing it was just a moment just an act and here they all are now so what's going to happen once they're all here? A declaration of that day. And so the word day is going to come quite a few times. Let's count it. I didn't count it before coming. I was going to be my mind at six, but, but let's, let, let's count it together. The word day is going to be ringing. You wanted to know, well, this is the day. 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 If the sun's running to its end point, this is the end point. This is the end point for every human journey. We all live in this world in different moments. We are born on different days. We are some of you know some are ancestors, some are descendants. But although we start the journey in different points physically on the earth, in actual fact, the end point, the journey is one. And in fact, as we're told elsewhere in the Quran, the journey even started at one point as well. Because what's not mentioned here is in, is in the image of Surah Yasin, but in Surah Al-Araf is that all souls were also summoned before God and they declared that, that he was their Lord. So actually the journey was also started together. But the earthly moment started in different stages and the final meeting is singular. It's one journey, one mustaqar that humanity is running to and it's this day, this day, this day, this day, this day. Uh, and it'll be ringing. Uh, in this surah what you're going to see in this verse is just the expression of absolute justice because the one who's apportioned an end for everything or a purpose because the end is synonymous with purpose then it's moving towards what it's there for he is the all wise and the all wise is the all just and the absolute justice is today meaning what took place before that was just a mirage P some people were wronged some people stole. Some people got what they didn't deserve. Some people deserved and they didn't get. But that wasn't the end point. That was just a momentary sojourn of this journey. But the real end point is here. لا تظلم نفس شيئا. No soul will be wronged a thing. Nothing will be taken from you that you deserve to keep. There'll be no wronging. No one will put onto you a burden that's not really yours. No one will accuse you of something you never ever did. No wrong will be felt by any soul at all. And what's the illustrative of that? It's the second part. And your jaza, you know, this is the, the noun, if you like, from this verb is jaza, pardon the handwriting. Jaza is recompense. It's what you get in return for something. 
لا تجزون you will not be given in recompense except one thing what is that one thing it's quite interesting exactly what you used to do uh, Aubrey adds the word according to in the translation but it doesn't exist within the Arabic the Arabic in the literal translation is you will not be given back except what you used to do so the literal meaning, if you like, is exactly what you did, exactly that is what you're going to get. Obviously, you're not going to get back exactly what you did. So it's not that you're going to be given back your prayers and giving back the money you spent in charity. And it's not like that, but it's emphasizing that what you're going to get is so just and so fair and so well measured and so appropriate uh, that it's almost exactly equal to what you did. So it's, again, this sentence is expressing absolute justice, and you could say absolute wisdom. Everything is perfect. Absolute perfection of what's coming on that day. And here you'll see the significance of everything. Because sometimes, uh, the because the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't belittle anything of, of the good. And he would say things like smiling is charity. So people might think smiling is worth little, but on that day you'll realize what smiling was really worth, i.e. cheering someone up for the sake of God, which is the most easiest thing sometimes. Uh, sometimes we pass it by and we'll, we'll be the losers for passing it by because then you'll see on that day what it was really worth because you will be given back exactly what you did. But exactly what you did has a worth which has been carefully, if you like, determined according to the system of wisdom and justice. So you'll see the real significance of nasty words. So there's a hadith that says, you know, you'll say a nasty word, you think it's worth nothing, but you'll plunge for it uh, into the fire. You know, nasty things. You think, oh, it was, it took you a second to say it and you think, oh, it's nothing. But on that day, you'll see what it was really worth and you'll get what it was really worth. Not more, not less. Absolute justice. You will not be paid back except exactly what you used to be doing. Constantly doing. Whatever it was you were doing with effort and intentionality, because amal means like work. Whatever you were working, that's what you're going to get. And now we're going to see, okay, so what are... In this day of absolute realities, the final endpoints, the real purpose of everything will be displayed. Then there's two camps of people, the people of the garden and the other people. So it goes now to the people of, of the garden and it describes their bliss today. Today, although in the description of events in this surah, they haven't yet entered the garden. In the description of events, what you're going to see is they've just gathered. And after this gathering, there's going to be a judgment and then people will be sent off. And so in the real, if you follow the order of events, they haven't yet gone there. But it's describing it as fact so that the people of that bliss immediately get their comfort. And it adds to the pain, if you like, of what, the unbelievers have squandered for themselves. So it's describing to them, look, that's what they're getting. Now let's talk about you. In, so what are they getting then? In ashab al al yawma fi fakihun. Verily doubt it not. This is what we've seen before. It's a full noun sentence. There's no verbs in it. There's no promises. It's just a statement of fact. What's the statement of fact? That the companions of the Jannah. Now the word Jannah, what does it mean? Uh, we translate it as garden, but in its root, it comes from the verb Jannah. Uh, sorry, which looks like the same word, but if you, what, in terms of the root, it's a jim and a noon and a noon. All the derivatives from this, from this three letter root in Arabic are all refer to something being concealed. So, for example, a fetus in the womb is called a janin. Why? Because it's hidden from us. We, we don't see it. We don't know what form it's in. We don't know who it looks like. Uh, and in the pre-modern world, you didn't know even if it, if, it, if it was alive. It was just inside. It's hidden. It's concealed. 
Um, an insane person is called a majnoon because he has junoon. What is junoon? It's the concealment of his, of his intellect. Hidden beings, we refer to them as jinn. Why? Because they're hidden, they're concealed. And so what kind of a garden would be called Jannah in Arabic? It's a garden of a very lush overgrowth. Think of like a, like, like a forest. You know, think of an, of an overgrowth that you're walking underneath and you can't see the sky because why? It's just this beautiful canopy of green that's over you. There's branches, there's leaves, and you're just walking under a very living green lush canopy. That's what the word Jannah means. And that's why, although it's not coming in this verse, the Quran then says it's Jannatin underneath which rivers are flowing. So the rivers aren't flowing underground, but they're flowing under the canopy. So it's this beautiful lush canopy of green. That's what the Jannah is. And the companions or the, 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 the residents of this Jannah today, again, it's, you know, it's rubbing it into these people that didn't believe in that day. And they belittled these people, said, well, no, this day, you'll see what these people are in. And these people are great. And these people are special. And these people are engrossed. Fi shuhulin. So shuhul is like busyness. You know, people go to work, they go to shuhul. Uh, they, go, they go to their offices. Uh, that's how we use shughal today, work, business, being busy. Business also comes from busy. It's, it's something, it's uh, engrossing you. And so the first thing you're being told is, oh, you know, the people of that Jannah, they are engrossed. Fi shughulin, completely engrossed. They are inside of a busyness indefinite for tremendousness. They are inside, they're engrossed in what they're in. They are... And in such a, a bliss, in such a joy, in such a pleasure, in such a fulfilling, such a happy, peaceful state of being that it's fully occupying them. It doesn't leave any spaces or any gaps for, uh, for a worry or for a concern or for anything. There's just completely, there's no gaps, they're full resplendent, full of this joy. And in this moment, engrossed in this incredible scene, they are fakihun. It's really interesting. You know, fakiha, we're going to see in a bit, fakiha means fruit. Uh, but fukaha means comedy in modern Arabic. You know, someone is a fukahi. In modern Arabic, we say he's a comedian. So fakihun, it's it's describing a, a beautiful joy, speech, speech that makes you happy, speech that makes you laugh. So you get this joy, this moment of just joy. They're talking, they're laughing, they're pleasing each other, and they're just engrossed. They're fully distracted from anything and everything else, except for that intense scene, an ongoing intensity of joy. Inna ashab al al yawma fi shughulin fakihun. So what are these? Give me more, you know, what's a, a description of what's occupying them so much? Uh, an important marker of bliss is that they're, they're not alone. They're with their spouses. Uh, it's not a lonely place. It's a, a place where you are with the people that, that you love. Al-Biqa'i, the Quran commentator, he contrasts it to their state in this life that, you know, sometimes they were too busy to be with their spouses. They had to go to work or they had to go and help someone. They might spend days in some righteous cause. And so they're not always with their families, which is, you know, people who do a lot of uh, charity work, you know, they might have to travel and leave their families for months or people who travel in knowledge. And so the idea is sometimes the good cause separates you from the people that you love. But now your shughal, your busyness is indeed with them now. They are with you in that busyness forever. Hum wa azwajuhum. And the word zawj, because you could refer to wife in Arabic as like mar, um, maratuhu, literally his woman. But that's a way to, to describe wife. 
but here the emphasis on the zod, the, the pairing, the perfect pairing, the perfect harmony, they with their harmonious equals are in that bliss together. Fi ghilalin, in shades. Again, not that it's hot and you need to go in the shade, but just because the shade is a marker of coolness, a breeze, a comfort with the people that you love, your, your, your people whom you have a, a harmonious pairing with. Al araik that's the plural of arika, which he translates here as uh, couches. It's what you would imagine, you know, this picture of these, you know, when you picture these, you know, luxurious, you know, Romans on what you get is this sort of, um, sort of like a bed spread, you know, it's, 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 car, it's uh, soft and they're re reclining on it. We see these pictures, they're lying on their sides, maybe leaning on their uh, elbows. Maybe they have cushions, they're eating their grapes and they're just laughing to their friends, all reclining on these couches, if you like. So that's the scene being pictured here. They're reclining. Ittika, it's just, the idea is just displaying this calm, blissful calm relaxation, enjoyment. Uh, and this arika, the way they describe it is it's like a um, mattress. It has legs, you know, it's stuck to the ground and it has a sort of, you know, curtain. Uh, um, what's, what's the word? Anyway, you get these beds with canopies around them. So it's like a, like a curtain surrounding, they say what you put a bride on. So that's the description of the word erika. So they're on this beautiful reclining, uh, soft place with the people that they love in the shade, completely engrossed with that, the joy of, this, of these ongoing moments and laughing with each other's happy speech. So the focus so far is on comfort, company, joy, and the, the it filling them up completely. Lahum fiha fakihatun, walahum ma yadda'oon. For them, in this abode is fruit, again, indefinite for sure, not just any fruit, but great fruit and abundant fruits. The interesting thing about fruit, and you can see now it shares the root with comedy and happy speech, is fruit is not something you typically eat because you're starving. Fruit is something you only eat for the pleasure. And so the idea is they have all this pleasure eating, everything that they'd love to eat and enjoy and the pleasure of all of that in abundance and in variety. And also in this world, fruit is something we don't eat as our main meal. You eat it maybe at the end. And so there's all other forms of food which have, which have not been mentioned, uh, which, the, which are mentioned you know, elsewhere. But the point here is just the focus is on the, the food of enjoyment, the food you just eat it for its savor, plentiful and, vary, and, and varied. Lahum, for them, in it is fruits. Again, a noun sentence, permanent statement. Walahum, and to repeat it, and for these people, because they're special people, for the sake of these, not for the sake of the others we're going to come to, but for these people is whatever they want to call, whatever they want to summon. Whatever, and you know, idia in this context means you want to call something because you really want it. Whatever their hearts desire, whatever their hearts desire to call, it comes. Whatever their hearts desire to be present, it's going to be present. These are the kings. What no king has ever enjoyed is what they're going to be enjoying. Whatever they want, it comes. Absolute service. Absolute bliss, absolute your heart's desire. That's basically what it means. And they have their heart's desire. But there is something which is the greatest desire of all. The greatest desire of all and the greatest experience of all. And it's the finest statement of their bliss. Salamun. Salamun qawlam mir rabbir rahim. And this is the greatest thing of all. Uh, the hadith says that when they're in their bliss and their food and their gathering and they're engrossed, engrossed meaning it's just, it fills them up with joy. 
the greeting from the Lord comes to them and it distracts them from all of that. It distracts them from all of that. However great, however pleasurable all these joys are, uh, these are created joys like us. But the greatest thing any created being could ever really experience, it is to connect with the uncreated. The greatest, the most indescribable experience for the finite is when it connects to the infinite because he is the source of every blessing. He is the one who's nurtured. He is the one who's cared. It's his beauty that we see in our food. It's his beauty we see in the sun. It's his extreme beauty that is dishonoring in the garden, but it's his beauty. And so there's nothing more beautiful. There's nothing that more captures them than the address and the beholding of the Lord himself. And so just like when you go to a palace and the banquet comes, the great thing is when the king says, welcome all of you to my palace. All of you are my honored guests. And so it's the address of, of that welcome from the Lord. That is the greatest thing of all. Salamun min rabbir rahim. Qawlan. It will be said to them. It will really be said to them. Not through an intermediary that the Lord is greeting you. The Lord is welcoming you. But the Lord will welcome them. And they will experience his speech. And they will behold him. Although they are incapable of any of this. But his mercy encompasses them. And he gives them the ability to bear this connection with the infinite, this connection with the unlimited, this connection with the uncreated, this connection with the infinitely beautiful, this connection with the infinitely majestic. And he is the Rabb. Here it's indefinite, although he is the Lord, it's indefinite just to show that the, the, the awesomeness of that moment. Peace will be said from an all-merciful, all-tender Lord. Just the, the, the awesomeness of, of that moment. Uh, Al-Qushayri says something in his tafsir, which I'll say in translation. He says, there's no doubt that nothing will equal this in all of the bliss. Nothing, nothing will equal this in bliss, in bringing coolness to the eye, which means tr tranquility in honor for these people, in showing the true height of their standing. He says, there's no doubt that this is the real objective in truth. This is at the heart of all of the bliss on that day. That day, which is the heart of all existence in truth. And so it's fitting that this verse is the heart of this chapter, just like this chapter is the heart of the, of the Holy Quran. That for these people who've gone on that whole journey, the journey ends really with the Lord, really in a being with him, in a real being with the all beautiful forever. And he will address them and they'll feel that address. And what's the address? That beautiful address of peace. Peace, 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 peace. Uh, the Quran wants to give great Almost an emotional connection with that word, peace. The abode is the abode of peace. Jannah is called Dar as Salam, the abode of peace. Peace means on one level, you're free, absolute safety, nothing to worry, nothing to fear, no problems. You people are in peace. Nothing will ever befall you again. And it's the greeting as if the Lord is saying, Welcome. He's honoring them. Uh, and so this is going up now to the height of their really being with him. They have a true sitting next to that all-powerful king. But let's come back to that moment again now. That's a glimpse into a particular future possibility for those who, wants to, who want to follow them. But let's come back to that moment we were just at to the other glimpse who are the people whose sar sarcasm brought about this whole description of this scene. And so now you get a whole other kind of address and look at the contrast of addresses. Peace, and now separate. 
imtazu wa imtazu al yawma ayyuha al mujrimun I've lost track of that I said we'll be counting together I think this is number 3 uh, yeah as far as I remember this is number 3 imtiaz you've heard of names imtiaz maybe you've heard the name mumtaz mumtaz you know in modern arabic means outstanding fantastic fabulous but what does it really mean what does outstanding mean it stands out from 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 the rest and so these group of people now everyone on that plane a group are told separate now go to the side uh, don't be with all the other people go to the side imtazu outstand yourselves separate yourselves alyom in that place you were together with them in this place that's it now this is the place of justice and you don't deserve to stand with those people because this is the place of what people deserve so stand by yourselves stand on the side ayyuha al mujrimun o oh, you criminals uh, that's in modern arabic again ijram is what you would use for for a crime so the people o oh, perpetrators of crime stand by yourselves now you don't deserve now that standing with these group of people and so now you have an address a reminder and this reminder goes back to the heart of how the surah has been arguing throughout alam a'had ilaykum ya bani adam alla ta'budu ash-shaytan innahu lakum aduwwun mubin didn't i say this if you again harken back to you know what you might the the scene of shame on earth that i mentioned was you know going back to your dad you know you you took his car without him knowing you you drove fast you crashed his car now you have to meet your dad the, the, the most incredible moment of shame he said didn't i tell you this just to bring it why on earth would you do that when you know but the strongest way to confirm that someone knows is through this question to confirm the fact not i've told you 100 times but didn't i tell you of course you knew it so why on earth alam a'had ilaykum didn't i give to you this solemn covenant so and and uh, ahad is used to mean this solemn covenant which is an injunction which you confirm you know in the strongest way that this is the injunction you know so you you point it out you deliver say that's it that's the important thing you hand the injunction over to someone and you ask them hold on to it hold tight to it it's this is this is what the whole thing is about so this is the ahad the covenant from god to the children of adam alam ahad ilaykum didn't i give this covenant over to you guys o children of adam why is the mention of adam so significant here because the story started with adam alayhi salatu wassalam and when the story started with adam someone came on that story someone too vile shaitan came on that story and in that very first moment adam slipped because of the shaitan and in that moment god was teaching adam and those who will come after adam this is your enemy this is what temptation means now go down to earth and do what it means to be real men if you like so adam as the descent of adam and his offspring to earth is not any expression of any original sin uh, as the quran presents it it's simply that adam had a destiny on earth which was to be god's representative on earth and to fulfill god's plan for man on earth but that thing happened up there in the garden to teach him something about what about the devil about temptation about the lord and about the all important thing which is what Re- repentance because adam said oh allah i'm sorry and allah forgave him repentance is the thing that the sons of adam all have and 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 the daughters of eve you know people human beings if the devil makes you slip just come back to your lord he will always forgive and so and this person here never said sorry and that's why he's he is called shaitan in, in describing the scene the original scene he's called iblis uh, his name which i understand that's the origin of the english word devil it comes from uh, anyway iblis diablos and it kind of has a journey towards the word devil 
Shaitan is like a title almost, or a descriptive of Iblis. And Shaitan in Arabic means, uh, is from Shaitan, that means the one who is remote, the one who is distant, the one who's distant from the mercy of God. And so, oh, you children of Adam, you know where you came from. You know the slip. I sent you with a full on practical lesson. And still you followed that guy who's distant from all mercy. And he didn't follow me instead. So if you look at how this comes now, oh, sons of Adam, meaning oh, children of Adam, didn't I give you the solemn covenant? What was the covenant? La ta'budu shaitan. Don't do the ibadah of the shaitan. Ibadah, we said last time, comes from the Arabic phrase, tariq mu'abbad, which means like the downtrodden road. So ibadah means to fully lower yourself, to fully negate yourself. You could say abase yourself. And so running after the devil, running after the temptation is essentially abasing yourself before this foul being. Why did you abase yourself to him? Didn't I tell you right from the beginning, don't abase yourselves to him. Don't surrender to him. He's remote. He's distant. He's vile. And to you guys, he's a sworn enemy. Innahu, verily he, for you guys, is adu, which means an extreme enemy. Very, very clear. And the second part of the covenant, mustaqim. And the second part of the covenant was don't surrender to this guy and his whisperings and his in insinuations. Rather, if you're going to abase, abase yourself, lower yourself, humble yourself just to me. And here we find Allah referring to himself with a singular first person pronoun. I think for the first time in this surah, the Quran has different references to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is a word of majesty might the full glory of the being of god i think we've only seen that once uh, in the surah rahman the all merciful whose mercy covers everything we've seen rub which is the nurturing lord who takes everything stage by stage we've seen the we of majesty which is often how god describes his acts we did we sent as tremendous acts but now it's a reference just to the being of god and it's just me i i was the one because it's about the the singularity of worship. I told you to worship me, surrender to me, lower yourself to me. This is a truly great path. Again, indefinite, just to show that it is the great, tremendous. This is a this is a true path, a correct path. This imagery of paths are, are going to come back now, just like we had them in the beginning. The surah is mirroring itself throughout. That's why as we keep studying, go back and look for the various themes. And I told you to surrender and lower yourself to me. This is a truly straight path. Again, we saw last time, the idea that it goes to a destination. A straight path is one that it's the shortest path. It has clear boundaries and it takes you somewhere. What's the idea of the devil? The devil hasn't even got a path. He just wants you to get lost with him. The devil is not you, the one who's been nurturing you. He's distant from all mercy. So what was wrong with you people? You ran after this one who wanted nothing. And I was right here. That's all that, that was all that you were ever told. And then this sort of lamenting, like we saw last time in, in the beginning of last session. Oh, what a lamented state people have. So this is almost like a lamenting here as well. وَلَقَدْ أَضَلَّ مِنْكُمْ جِبِلًّا كَثِيرًا أَفَلَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْقِلُونَ So you really feel the shame is really going deeper and deeper and deeper into these people who are gathered on that plane. And surely, I swear, he led astray. Again, أَضَلَّ Dalal means to be lost, the opposite of being on, on a path. He took you all off the path. He took from amongst you Amongst you, I, you saw it happening amongst your own people. Why didn't you reflect on what he was doing? Jibillan kathira. Jibillan kathira, he's translating as many a throng, which is a fair translation. Jibil means a large group. It's connected to the word jabal. Jabal means, you know, what's, what, what, when jabal means mountain. What's a mountain? It's huge and it's firm. So they say jibil means a large group of people 
And it implies within the derivation of the word that they had the ability to be firm like a mountain. They had the ability to have resolve. They had it within them to resist and they were huge. And yet this whisperer pulled them all off the path. So he led astray huge throngs amongst you and you saw that. You saw the vile outcomes of wicked people. You saw the marks of all these destroyed people from before. Again, the theme that we saw in the beginning of Surah Yasin. Afalam takunu taqilun. So this is a question of rebuke. Uh, so this is the word then. So then, did you observe all of that? And then you were not. Lam is in the past because we're on judgment day now. So did you observe all of what was happening around you? All the destruction uh, that you were seeing reminds me of again the the you know the rug that's being pulled even as we're speaking under the entire debt economy that we're in right now. I mean, you just see it. Uh, people who build an entire system based on uh, based on uh, exploitation, it will be pulled, and you see it in front of your eyes. And so people see this the wrongdoer just being pulled and you, you observe, were you not using your aqals? Were you not taqilun? Where were your minds gone? Showing that anyone with any brain would have figured this out. You guys are what, where were your brains? Were you not using your aqals? And so then they're told, okay, well, that's it. This is the day of justice. That's it, it's right there now. No, it's not even there, it's here. You see it. There it is. هَذِهِ jahannam. This is Jahannam. أَلَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُوَعَدُونَ This is the Jahannam that you were constantly being warned about. Again, present tense verb within the past. This is the Jahannam you were constantly warned about by the prophets, by their followers, by the teachings that, that were left behind. You were constantly reminded about hell, 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 hell. And it's funny, even in common parlance, there's hell is in all of our common parlance in so many uh, different ways. It's just, it's, th there's no hiddenness about this, uh, about this threat uh, from, from God, Jalla Jalaluhu, in all these teachings. So this is Jahannam. The origin of the word Jahannam, some say it's from a deep well. They, they say they used to call it Bi'r Jahannam, which is like a deep well. So you could translate Jahannam from that idea as this is the abyss, like the deep fall, the deep plunge. And some say it comes from the word tajahum, uh, which is when you meet someone with a really mean, ugly face and you're very harsh with them. So it's this harsh being. This is the harsh, ugly being because it suits the way you were when you were killing that believer in Surah Yasin, when you were going to kill the prophet. So. Think of the, the mirroring again of who's being spoken to. This is the vile, mean-faced being, if you like. هَذِهِ jahannam That you were constantly warned about. إِسْلَوْهَ الْيَوْمَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْفُرُونَ And so feel its heat well today. So salia means to really feel the full force uh, of this fire. So feel well its heat today. I've lost track. Is this number four? Feel the full force of this today. This is that day. Why? Bima. Be by virtue of, in face of, due to, and equal to that you were constantly doing kufr. Again, present tense verb in the past. You were constantly doing kufr. Kufr in Arabic means to cover something over. In its origin, they would use it even for burying a seed in the ground. So it's like a, it's like a farming word. Uh, as is falah, which means success. So its origin, it has this idea of burying over a seed. And it came to be used for uh, unbelief because it's burying over uh, whatever you learn from the signs, whatever moments, you know, you get a moment, you think, wow, and you bury it over, you think, no, I, I don't want to think. You have a near, near death experience, you think, wow, I should really think about it. Then you bury it over, think, no, don't worry about it. Let's just go back to a life of distraction. Uh, they would hear the Prophet reciting these verses, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I think we're slowly getting a taste of how moving these verses are. And they would be gripped by them. They'd be drawn to them. 
their imaginations would would be carried off by these verses and then covered over. Say, no, no, don't worry about it. Let's go back because we have our people, we have our pride, we have our tribes. This man is bringing bad luck. He's going to make us losers. No, we don't want this. So the kufr is this constant fight against the ayat of Allah. And the ayat of Allah, the signs of God are in the universe. They're in the own life that you lead. Everyone has a moment when suddenly something gets, some rug gets pulled of, you know, of, you know, this rug of self-reliance gets pulled. You realize, whoa, you get these near life, you know, or these real odd coincidences that just save your life or save your career. Or there's constant things that God is putting in your path to show, hey, I'm here, by the way, you know. Uh, you call out, or it talks about the scene of when, when they're at sea, they call him to help them, and he really saves them in the middle of clear death. He's plotting all these plots along their life stream, you know, their, their journey of life, that I'm God, I'm here. You called me yesterday, right? I saved you, right? Uh, and of course, then the ayat of, of, of the prophets and the warnings of the believers. So, so that's why it's constant kufr in the present tense. You're constantly recovering, constantly recovering, constantly disinterested, constantly turning away from me. You know, and these ayat were constantly coming towards you. That's why this is it now. Al yawma. Is this number five? Uh, this is the last verse, inshallah, we'll, we'll cover today. It feels like a very abrupt stop because we're still on that scene. Uh, but it's going uh, it's gonna to blend very smoothly into its next section. So although it feels abrupt right now, we're going to leave Judgment Day altogether with our next section. And then from that, the surah is going to conclude. And it's very it's concluding final scene. So we'll inshallah do that next time. al today, nakhtimu ala afwahihim. In this verse, we're looking at right now, uh, they're not being spoken to anymore. So you could say uh, the whole verse was speaking to the people who said, when is this promise? Um, we saw that uh, they're running towards their Lord. Then we were told, what, today no soul is going to be wronged. And you will not be given except what you've done. So from that place, you will not be given except what you've done. You can see all of this as a direct speech act. They're being spoken to. In here, they're being turned away from now. They're not being spoken to. Uh, they're being spoken about. The idea is that it's it's done now. They're, 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 they're being d d demeaned. They're being put down. And not only that, but look at the scenery. Their, their, their mouths are going to be, have some, some cover will go over their mouths. We will place in our might a seal, a khatam. Khatam in classical Arabic is when you seal something. Typically, you'd seal a letter with some melted wax and you'd put your khatam on it, which your khatam, which is your ring, to do a seal to show that this letter has come truly from whoever sent the letter. So there'll be some seal, some khatam placed over their mouths. Why? Because we're fast forwarding a bit because judgment is happening and they're seeing what's what's about to come and they're trying to pass off all kinds of excuses. Now, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. It was that person. I didn't know. And and actually, I never did the shirk anyway. And you know what? I didn't. The, all these excuses are about to come. So after a while, then just the khatam goes on their mouths. Allah, af, Allah shows it's completely upon. It's coming down upon. It's firm. Afwahihim. On to this day, we'll put the khatam. So we put this khatam over their mouths. Present tense verb here. Their hands will be speaking to us. The hands will be speaking to us. وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُلُهُمْ and their feet are going to be testifying. All to own up to whatever these people used to be doing kesp of, whatever they used to be earning. Kesp is a word, uh, literally means, we use modern Arabic for, you know, for what you've earned, what you earn in your working place. It's referring to the actions they did in this earth as kesp. What does kesp mean? When you earn, what does it mean? It means you, you put effort into something. And that something is valuable. You think it's a very worthwhile endeavor and you do it constantly. 
because your earning means it's not just a one-off. And so it's referring to the worldly endeavors of these people as kesp. They put so much effort into it. They thought it was so valuable, stabbing him to take his job and cheating him to get, you know, they, they thought they were acquiring, but really it was nothing but doom for them. And their bodies were witness to everything. And on this day, the body is not completely theirs anymore. The body ran with them to judgment day. And when this tongue is trying to lie, well, the body will be told, you speak, hand, you did it. Tell me what you did. And the hand will speak. In Surat Fusilat, it says their skins will speak. And it says over there that they will say to their skins, Lima shahidtum alayna, why are you testifying against us? And the skins will reply, God has given us the power to speak, the one who gave everything the power to speak. And so there's almost this out of body now. The body itself is there. And very interestingly, the feet are testifying, uh, but the hands are speaking because the hands are, in most cases, they are the perpetrators. And the feet are more like witnesses who are present at every deed the hands have done. And so it's absolute justice. Whatever perpetrated will speak, whatever lies are shut, and absolute justice will happen. That is the day. And so you can see it's been a very powerful journey, a very rigorous one. Uh, and it's rigorous, it's designed to be rigorous because if anyone is asking this question with a modicum of sincerity, they're gonna stop and think now. They're going to stop and think what it's all about. Should they, for a moment, so this covering of kufr has been revealed. That, that's what the, these scenes of the Quran are to reveal the covering so that a soul can have a chance uh, to fight off the covering uh, and to think for itself. But within this, we hearken back to the beginning of the surah again of what? There are people who will closely follow the reminder. And they're the ones the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is truly warning. They are the people of the garden. And their journey is beautiful. And their bliss is incredible. And they'll be with the one that they love. And the one whose love has covered them in this life. And in this world, being with him was their, was their joy. And so being with him there, that is the bliss of all blisses. And everybody else, what have you been doing? Why have you done this to yourselves? What we'll see next time is a reference that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, and we, this ceiling, we could have done it right now because they deserve it. And it goes back to some of the imagery that we saw at, at the beginning. Then it will speak back about the Quran and the Prophet to bring that loop back together from where the surah started. Then it goes to its uh, conclusion. Uh, so we'll just stop and just take a few questions. Uh, okay, so some uh, tricky questions here. I'll answer with what I can, and you're more than welcome also to ask uh, other teachers here uh, in these live sessions as well. So first of all, there's a question here in Iron 56. Is shade not referred to as uh, that believers will have on that day while others are in the heat? So obviously, so the Quran is folding up. Um, it's folding up a huge set of events. It's a very long day, that, that day, which is emphasized the day, the day, the day, the day, the day. And I said, there's also two stages as well. There's a destruction, there's some period of time, and then there's the actual resurrection, which the Quran sometimes folds up into a single event because in the larger scheme of things, it's a single thing, um, a single act, a single movement on to, to the next life. So in that, if you were to zoom into that moment, which has been folded up here, then yes, there's, there's a time when everyone is just standing, when they've run to the gathering point and they're waiting. They're waiting, 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 waiting. Uh, and so the Hadiths talk about that, that moment of waiting and it gets very, very hot. The sun comes down. It's very, very hot. Everyone's naked because they've come out of their graves, uh, but they're too concerned about other things to be, pay any attention to the fact that they're naked. They're sweating, and some hadiths talk about two different amounts depending on their sin, essentially, whether it's to their ankles or whether it's higher. Um, but on that day, uh, the awliya ar-Rahman, the people who are the, the friends of God, they have, a, they have comfort on that day. They have shade. Uh, 
on that day. They're shaded um, uh, by, by the shade of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, as described in uh, some hadith. So that's what's being referred to. That's a different shade from this description of the shade of, of paradise. And again, there's parallels constantly between the Jannah and the Nar, the garden and the fire. So the Quran refers to shade in hell as well. But that's the shade of smoke. The only shade they have is the shade of smoke. And these guys have to have a blissful shade. But it's not what you're referring to is the shade on before the actual judgment takes place altogether. That's that it's in the hadith of the great intercession of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because everybody is so hot and so full of the panic of waiting. They just wanted to get over with. And so they ask someone, can you get this thing started? And they finally ask the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he will go and prostrate and he will ask Allah. And then, then the whole ceremony will start. It starts with him actually, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The one whose messengerhood is what this Surah Yaseen is certainly all about. Are these descriptions metaphorical or literal? Uh, we take them as literal, uh, but they're using words that we comprehend and what they will actually be like uh, is something that we'll have to be there to see. Uh, what do we mean by that? So the Quran refers to they eat fruit and they think, oh yeah, it's just like something we've eaten, but it's not like anything they've eaten because this is the, because the abode we're in right now is an abode of, ultimately it's the abode of the, the moral test. And there's great blessings here, and each blessing is a test. Are you grateful? Uh, are you patient if you don't have it? The abode over there is the abode of Allah's absolute generosity. And so the words are similar, but the experiences can't be imagined. You know, one of the saintly figures, uh, Abdul Aziz al Dabagh, he said he had a, he had a sort of vision. Uh, they call it a kesh, like a spiritual vision where he beheld one of the leaves of the trees of the garden. And he said the experience of that was too indescribable for him to express what it felt like. And so what's indicated there is just that it's literal in as much as it's real. But what it is, uh, words can't imagine, you know, in, in the words of, of the hadith. Wala khatara ala qalbi, you know, it's not, uh, how does the hadith go? Fiha ma la ra'at, wala udhun sami'at, wala khatara ala qalbi. I can't remember the last word now. In it is something that no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, has never crossed to the heart of a person. So it's the absolute generosity of God, Jalla Jalaluhu, expressed in words that, that we understand. So I'll say it's literal, but it's also beyond the imagination as well, what that feeling is. Uh, does yadda'una have the same root as dua in it? Uh, yes, it does. It's from the word dua. Uh, but it's not yad'una, which would technically mean they are calling. It's yad'una. There's a form of emphasis here. Scholars have a variety of interpretations of how the yad, what this form implies. And what we've mentioned here is it means summoning with extreme desire. What they really want, they'll just call it. Will Allah change their sins into good deeds after the judgment has ended? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his generosity... Uh, there's many things we can't completely picture, except that Judgment Day is a day of justice and gen generosity. It's not a day of wrongdoing. So there's no wrongdoing. It's you get exactly what you deserve or you could get better than what you deserve. That's it. So there's justice and generosity, adl and fadl. And in the generosity of Allah, yes, you know, the Quran mentions really interesting things like uh, it mentions a few different places. You will be rewarded based on the best of your actions. And what many scholars interpret, if you look at, for example, our daily prayers, some of our prayers, we might be quite distracted. You know, a lot is, a lot is going on. We pray dutifully, and that's a great thing, but we're distracted. Some of our prayers, we're really, really present. And so, so scholars say that you will be rewarded based on your best prayer, your best dhikr, your best fast your best act of charity, your best display of compassion, because we are going through a school of life. We're training ourselves. And in his generosity, he'll deal with you to the best of what you reached, not your medium and not your worst. 
And so these are different displays of his generosity on Judgment Day. As part of his displays, yes, uh, there are some people who have a best and they have uh, slips. And those very slips will become good deeds for them. Why? Because their trajectory became so good. Hadith of, of, the, of, the, of, of the lady prostitute uh, of, from Bani Israel, the Prophet said so she was a prostitute. Uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said she was a prostit prostitute. She saw a thirsty dog. She felt compassion for it. She, she fed it with water from a well she put into her shoe. And Allah forgave her for that. Uh, or everything which, which went to pass. And she had a very good trajectory thereafter. So the idea is she did bad, but it's forgotten now because her trajectory was good. And so God, Allah changed all of her book to books of good. And so the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is huge. All we are asked to do is turn towards him. He is the all generous. That's what this life is. It's a life of generosity, that we have life. We exist. Existence is a great gift from Allah to us. We, we forget about. We could have been nothing. Each one of us speaking right now and, and hearing and being here. And so it's the ongoing gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all, he, all he's asking is recognize. That's it. It's just actually one thing. Recognize the gift. That is what faith is. Kufr is also used for ingratitude, which is not recognizing the gift at all. As you recognize the gift, a relationship develops. You'll slip, that's okay. That's the great story of Adam. He slipped. That didn't diminish from who he was. Allah forgave him and Allah made him a great representative. And so we all have that journey. We will slip. We're meant to slip. But we're meant to recognize the gift. And whenever we slip, we just try better to come back. And his generosity will cover the believers. Rabbin Rahim. So yes, there are people whose bad deeds become good deeds from the generosity of Allah. And it's a reflection of their good trajectories that the bad is all forgotten uh, altogether. Why is the word Rabb translated as Lord? Yeah, this is interesting. Um, master, uh, I'm thinking, we would have to think about it because sometimes it, it you know, the one who's training and nurturing is often the, the master of something. The question is, why is Rabb sometimes or, or usually translated as Lord? And I'll even translate it as Lord. It's the most common one word translation because when you're nurturing, you're, you're also owning, you're controlling, you're, you're containing. Uh, and so in normal Arabic, you might say, you know, housewife is called Rabbat al-Manzil. There is not so much ownership, but she's, that's her domain. And so they use the word Rabb or Rabba there. Slave master relationship might be called rub in classical Arabic, uh, Lord, master. So it has a connotation of master, but it has a connotation of a nurturing master. Uh, the last thing, and we will really have to stop. Uh, just a small Arabic point, you know, the verb speaking and witnessing for the hands and feet, why did it start with ta? It's just because they're feminine and so you'll learn that as you learn uh, Arabic so we'll stop here thank you all very very much uh, please keep us all in your prayers may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you in these uh, in these last 10 nights of uh, Ramadan and we again from us here at at the college we do hope you've been benefiting from our program and we do encourage you again you know in these last 10 nights please do uh, donate gen generously to support the work of the college so we can carry on uh, Serving, serving you and serving our world community, uh, inshallah, with these lessons. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you, bless you in these nights, bless your families. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.